Good afternoon and welcome to today's live webcast on the state of the labor market in North Central Wisconsin. I'm Renee Krings, Economic Development Specialist with the Greater Wausau Chamber of Commerce. Today's program will provide a comprehensive look at the region's economy and labor market, both pre and post pandemic. The presentation will offer strategies for organizational success, as well as tactics for talent attraction and retention. Following the presentation, attendees will have an opportunity to participate in a Q&A session with our presenters. Today, we'll have an opportunity to hear from Derek Heikinen, Business Director with the North Central Wisconsin Workforce Development Board, and Mitchell Rupp, Regional Economist with the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development's Office of Economic Advisors. Before we get started, I'd like to make a quick mention that today's event is being recorded and will be available on the Chamber's YouTube and social media pages following the event. At this time, I'd like to welcome our presenters, Derek and Mitch. Thank you, Renee. I just want to start off, uh, everybody that's in attendance here today on behalf of Mitch and myself, also the Wausau Chamber, we greatly appreciate uh, your attendance and participation and the opportunity to present today. Uh, Mitch and I will be kind of painting a picture for you guys. I know that, you know, 2021 wasn't the most optimal year uh, based on everything that uh, business had to adjust and plan for. Um, human capital obviously being one of those, a lot of tough decisions had to be made. Um, stemming out of that, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of questions uh, that businesses are going into and experiencing, especially during this time as it relates to talent, a lot of anticipatory retirements upcoming as well. So, Mitch, I'd just like to take some of your time today to kind of paint a picture for you guys on, on where we've been and where we're trending and provide you with some uh, tools and useful information that hopefully can benefit your business and industry. So first, we'd just like to start with a, a regional overview on how we closed out in 2020. Um, and this is the nine county North Central region as defined by the state of Wisconsin and the Office of Economic Advisors. So we closed out our population at 413,000. Um, we had 216,000 of those uh, populating our total regional employment. And then we uh, averaged about a job share wise, about $55,000 as a median salary um, in terms of economic speak. So that kind of just shows where we're trending at the end of the year. Uh, our population increased by 0.3% since 2015, according to census data. It's expected to increase by 0.2% uh, between 2020 and 2025, roughly ballparking 937 people, um, calculating in birth rates and things of that nature. Um, from 2015 to 2020, jobs increased by 1.3%. Um, so we went from 213,000 all the way up to 216,000. So um, that's reflective in our labor force participation rate as well, which is something that Mitch is going to dive into a little bit later. So really high labor force participation rate in this area. Um, concerning educational attainment, 15.4% of uh, the residents in our region that are in the workforce uh, have currently have a, a baccalaureate degree or higher and 11.4% home and associates degree. That's non-reflective of, um, that's just painting a picture in terms of the educational skill here. And what Mitch and I talk about a little bit later when people first see that slide, they think that uh, that might mean we're undereducated in a sense. That's just based on uh, our job share and our total labor market, market economy in terms of our tax infrastructure, what jobs are in place. Um, primarily, most of the skilled uh, jobs here um, that compile the North Central region don't require the higher degree of a um, level of education as a large MPA or metro district such as like Chicago or New York might have being a predominantly rural market. And then the top three industries in 2020 based on just job, job share alone were education and hospitality um, in terms of restaurants and local government and hospitals. So healthcare, education and uh, government and hospitality making up your, your large markets here. Um, region, it's just that's job share, that's not GRP as well. And then regional capital overview, just in terms of what the talent is trending towards in our area. Um, 69,000 uh, of the people in our area that are eligible for the workforce are of the millennial generation. Uh, I talked about anticipatory retirement. So we have 153,000 uh, roughly people retiring from the workforce. Uh, every industry sector that we look at, and this might be something that a lot of businesses in the industry are experiencing now, shows an anticipatory retirement rate of 25%. 
So whether that be manufacturing, healthcare, construction, finance, insurance, wholesale, trade, what have you, transportation, uh, a lot of companies look like they're going to be planning for impending retirements or it's at least tracking that way, provided that everybody's retiring around that 65 to, to 67 year old age range. Um, they can expect that 25% uh, of the more higher skilled, higher knowledge, long-term employees uh, will be exiting the workforce, which is difficult um, to make up in terms of, of their knowledge base and capacity. Um, we have less than, far less than normal, according to the national average, in terms of racial diversity, just under 40,000 um, racially diverse members of the population. Um, that affects diversity and inclusion. Higher than normal veterans population in the workforce, which is something that's always strong, good to see, and something that uh, our vets population is highly sought after uh, by members of the, of the uh, job market in all sectors. So close to 30,000 vets entering the workforce. We're actually seeing that number uptick a little bit as well, being that Wisconsin offers a state and federal GI Bill. So a lot more of our uh, vets talking to the Office of um, Veterans Employment Services are, are coming back in, in higher abundance to the areas where they grew up on the exit of the military. So that's very strong to see and a good sign for the future. Uh, violent crime. So it's a very good area and uh, strong communities to live in and raise families in with violent crime far below the national average at 1.8% per 1,000 individuals. And then property crime is low as well. So even though we are a rural market uh, with, you know, similar talent shortages as the rest of the country, uh, one of our advantages in this area is it is a good place to work, raise, work live and raise a family. Uh, this is your labor force view and Mitch is going to go way into the weeds on this later and kind of explain to you guys what this means. But uh, total population, like I talked about, is 413,000. Your total working age population, so that's people 15 and older that are able to go into the workforce at either part or full time, uh, is 345,000. Of those not in the labor force or correlate, correlative to our unemployment rate of that 345,000 that are, are 15 and older is 136,150. A strong number of those obviously are still in high school, so that's not something to get too uh, concerned about because if you see on the next slide, total in the labor force out of the 345,000 is actually 209 of those uh, full-time FTEs over 18 that are in the workforce that encompass that 209,000, roughly only 9,500 are unemployed right now. So uh, this will get more reflective when we talk about the unemployment rate coming out of COVID um, and where we're tracking, but we're tracking well. Uh, we're close to where we are at pre-pandemic and our unemployment numbers, which is a good sign that the economy is, is slowly starting to shift and turn around. I talked about our educational attainment rate uh, reflective to the available talent in the market today. So this kind of paints a broad spectrum. You can see that quite a few of our, our uh, working age population at least have a high school diploma, uh, a good portion have some college experience, and then uh, associate degree and bachelor's degrees um, around the 11.4 and 54%. And that'll, when we get into our tax structure and our primary markets, that'll be easily more reflective. Um, a lot of the jobs that we have in terms of our market share are the, are the skilled trade type jobs. Or like we talked about restaurant and hospitality being of high volume in terms of the job share in the slide before. Um, so we don't have the volume that larger metropolitan districts might have in terms of requirements for the available jobs of four degrees or higher. However, at the end here, we'll learn about where our uh, market economy is trending and how that number might greatly, greatly shift over the next decade or so. Mitch is going to talk to you guys now about UI claims and some unemployment trends and what that means for your workforce. Yeah, so starting on the left graphic, we're looking at the state of Wisconsin as a whole. And the blue line is for initial claims, which is when uh, a claimant makes their first claim. And then the red line is for continued claims, which is what they file every week. Uh, and so this graph is showing the multiple in comparison to 2019. So you can see in about week uh, or UI week 13, we had about 20 times the typical uh, number of initial claims. And then as time progressed, uh, that multiple number of value started decreasing. So we made a lot of progress in terms of kind of bouncing back, um, but we're not quite there yet. So in UI week about 45 at the end of that graphic, it shows that we were, about, <clears throat> we were at about five times the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we were at about five times the level of what we would typically see in 2019. And then on the rate graphic, we have continued UI claims. And this is comparison to 2009, which is looking at our 2009 recession. And you can see that we actually have been bouncing back 
from this COVID pandemic much quicker than what we had in that 2009 recession. So it's been a much different uh, sort of hit to the economy. So looking at unemployment here, so no matter if you're looking at Marathon, North Central, the US or Wisconsin, it's all been the same trend, which is that from about 2010, which was really where we saw the peak in all of our unemployment rates, um, that started decreasing. And then when we got hit with the COVID pandemic, that really spiked up. And then you can see on the right side of the graphic, uh, in the month of December, Marathon was at a 4.1% unemployment rate, which was much lower from the April rate of 11.5. So then looking at the state of Wisconsin um, by county, so the left graphic is showing December 2019, and then the right graphic is showing December uh, 2020. You can see that we're essentially kind of close to where we used to be, as Derek was pointing out earlier. So for example, in 2019, in the month of December, Marathon was at 2.7. And then in December of 2020, we we're at 4.1. So we're not quite there yet, but we have bounced back uh, significantly. And you'll also notice on the right side graphic, there are higher unemployment rates um, when you look at the most Northern counties. Just can I jump in for a second that too? Yeah. Just to better understand which is data too for you guys, um, the threshold which we measure full employment by is roughly close to 5%, give or take. So anytime you see an unemployment rate dip below 5% in terms of what that means for available talent that's unemployed in the region, you're basically at full employment. And that means that a lot of that population that's left over that's looking for employment uh, is either you know coming out of the, the educational system or might have some barriers to employment that they're working with with uh, workforce development agencies or partners. So just in terms of painting a picture of what that means for talent sourcing, we're almost back to uh, where we were before. We had 3.2% in March, so we're already trending back um, to where we were before. So a lot of the people that were unemployed pre-pandemic are the ones that are populating that unemployment market now, you know, as late as, as most recently as December this year. And then this should be uh, your slide. Uh, this is just painting a historical perspective uh, of where we are compared to other recessions. Like Mitch talked about, um, obviously we're coming out of this thing a little bit faster in terms of the um, the jump that you know occurred in twenty you know ten with the stock market crash and things like that. But it's pretty on, on par and comparable in terms of what businesses had to endure. Um, as other recessions in U.S. history, most notably, obviously, uh, post-World War II and then the Great Recession of 1929. Um, similar metrics and numbers to how reflective it was in our economy for business and industry. But trending back, like Mitch talked about, which faster, which is a good, thought, a good sign that speaks to the um, ingenuity and flexibility of our business and industry, our educational partners and our community partners and, and providing enough resources um, with local government to get back as soon as possible. So then I'm looking at our projected population change, uh, and this is for 2020 to 2040. Uh, you'll see that overall for most of the counties in the state of Wisconsin, you'll be expecting increases in your population. Uh, but when you look at our region, uh, we have Landglade and Wood County uh, that are expected to have a decrease in their population. Um, but outside of that, we should be increasing uh, and we'll certainly be increasing overall because we'll have about a gain of 15,060 um, in our population for the region. And then this graphic, so <clears throat> it's looking at the population that's age 65 years old and older. Uh, what percent of the population does that group um, make a part of that? So the left graphic is 2020 and the right graphic is 2030. You can see that you, there's a huge uh, increase in a lot of our northern counties in terms of how much more of a proportion that older age group makes up. Um, and this is the age group that's you know retired or about to retire. So a lot of our northern counties, especially in our area, we're going to be having a lot of um, we're going to be having a lot of difficulties in in terms of trying to fill those positions that those um, people leaving the workforce are going to be leaving behind. So we'll have a little bit more of a difficult problem than um, other places. And from a business perspective on the slide, 
when you're thinking about future talent recruitment, you know, with the impending retirements that are being forecasted, you can see obviously the more green or blue you are, um, you know, the younger you are as Kyan, which is slides right here. And then he talked about aging out. Some factors for that obviously are cost of living, you know, family sizes get smaller. There's less coming out of our K-12 system. Um, net loss of family farms in Wisconsin, especially in the rural markets, play a role in that. So there's going to be less and less talent available over the next decade when we're going through these shortages for business and industry that they're going to have to account for, um, you know, in, in uh, you know, northern and surrounding counties where they might ordinarily have had sex, success recruiting. So it's something to just think about in your, your planning for the future and how you're going to source talent. Uh, so looking at our labor force participation rates, um, and if you're wondering what does that mean exactly, well, if you're looking at our population that's aged uh, 16 years old or older, what percent of them is participating in the labor force? And as Eric mentioned before, we have a very high labor force participation rate. So for Marathon, we're at 67.9% uh, as of 2019. And while these rates uh, do show a, a decline in recent years, that's due to the baby boomers that have been retiring and leaving the um, workforce and choosing not to uh, continue participating, but overall we've been having an excellent uh, participation rate. So then <clears throat> we'll look at uh, the trends in terms of labor force. So the right graphic is Wisconsin, as you can see after the 2009 recession, we had really slow growth um, and then kind of nearing towards the end of 2017, that kind of started dropping down, but again, likely due to the um, aging workforce that we have. Uh, now, if you look at Marathon, it's a little, little bit of a different picture, but it's still the, the same kind of story. After that 2009 recession, uh, instead of us having that slowed labor force growth, we actually had a declined uh, labor force. And then that started picking up. And then again, uh, towards the end of 2017, that started dropping down a bit. Um, so again, really just kind of showing uh, the fact that we've had an aged labor force and our labor force growth has been slowing. So uh, it's going to be increasingly important to kind of hold on to workers you already have um, with our slow labor force growth. Uh, and now this graphic is uh, for the U.S. Uh, looking at labor force participation rates by age. Um, so there's a couple of takeaways from this graph. Uh, one is that obviously the older that a, a person becomes, uh, the less likely they are to participate in the labor force because they're going to be, you know, maybe having health problems or retiring or what have you. Um, but another thing to note here is that uh, if you look on the left side of the graphic, uh, the year 1998 is that top line, and then the line below that is 2008, followed by 2018, uh, and then at the very bottom it's uh, the year 2028. So as time has been moving forward, uh, we've seen that these uh, more youthful age groups, the 16 to 19, the 20 to 24, the labor force participation rates have been decreasing as time has progressed. Uh, and then if you look towards the right side of the graphic, you'll see that um, the older uh, age groups have been having an increased participation rate, which also means that people aren't um, retiring as early as they used to since they've been continuing to be involved with uh, the labor force. Uh, and then basically to wrap kind of what we've been talking about up with population and labor force, here's kind of like the orange line, uh, blue line that you may have seen in the past. Uh, but essentially the orange line here is population and you'll see that it just continues to increase as you'd expect. Uh, however, when you look at labor force line below that, you see that the growth really kind of tapers off and starts plateauing out. Uh, but again, that's due to uh, the baby boomers leaving the workforce. So. This kind of just sums all that up really nicely. Uh, now looking at Wisconsin as a whole for employment change by industry, uh, and this is comparing 2019 to 2020 uh, for, for the month of April for that first column, and then for the month of December for that second column. And you'll see that, <clears throat> so well, first off, the month of April is when we had uh, really the worst effects from uh, the COVID pandemic. So for the state of Wisconsin, our total non farms uh, total non-farm jobs decreased by 15.7% from April 2019 to April 2020. Um, and then you'll obviously see that leisure and hospitality dropped by 58.8%. And that was the hardest to industry. 
um, as a lot of hotels and uh, businesses of that nature kind of had to close their doors and travel slowed down. Uh, and then that last column there, December to December of 2019 to 2020, uh, you'll see that we've we've regained um, a considerable portion of uh, our employment that we had decreased originally. So in the month of uh, December, the total non-farm jobs was now at a decrease of 6.9%, as opposed to the, the worst of it, which is the decrease of 15.7%. Um, and then also notably, we had two uh, sectors that increased um, with their employment, which was the mining, logging, and construction sector and construction. Um, that increased as well by 2.9% and 3.3% uh, respectively. Um, and then if you take a look at the leisure and hospitality, third from the bottom, you'll see that for December, it was now at a decreased or um, lowered employment change of 28.5%, um, which is almost half of what we lost in the month of December, or the month of April, which was a decrease of 58.8%. So now looking at our region for industry employment, and this is for 2020 quarter two, um, and this is ranked uh, from top to bottom, the industries that have the highest employment share. So our top three biggest industries at the top, which is trade, transportation, utilities, which employs 38,468 people, make up 21.8% of our employment, followed by education and health services, uh, and followed by manufacturing. So those are our three biggest industries. And then that last column shows uh, from 2019 quarter two to 2020 quarter two. Uh, it just shows kind of what that change in employment looked like. So again, you have leisure and hospitality in our region um, that showed a decrease of 29.5% over that time frame. Um, and all of our industries actually showed a, a decrease in our employment. The picture Mitch painted was outstanding and, and kind of reflective in terms of where the people are working and what sectors. Um, in terms of what make up our largest industry by job share. Um, now I'm looking at painting a different picture in terms of which are our largest industries, not only by job share, but also tax and economic impact. So directly reflected off Mitch, this is how they compare um, based on Mitch's slides versus the national average. So the blue line being our region, obviously the gray dash being, um, you know, the national average. So. He talked about it, manufacturing, healthcare, trade and transportation being some of the biggest ones, uh, well above the national average. That's reflective uh, in our G GRP and GDP in terms of uh, our tax infrastructure. So higher volume, higher paying jobs, those occupations as well, a lot more opportunity um, for career advancement for an entry level employee, which uh, can be enticing, uh, which you know you, drives more people there. But in terms of, I talked about the educational stat earlier too. If we look at, you know, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, trade and transportation. Um, so a large part of those uh, degree paths either require an associate some college or um, high school experience uh, in those sectors, which is why reflective of our tax base and where the number of jobs are based on the number of companies here, uh, that's why you see that number being the way it is. Now, economic impact wise, um, in terms of importance, you can see manufacturing, finance and insurance and healthcare being the big three with trade and transportation and, and wholesale trade being up there as well. In terms of a tax base, probably the, the, there's really roughly, you know, four or five that are most important in protecting and making sure that the number of human capital there is strong. Um, because if it's strong there, that creates more regenerative tax dollars and it helps control, you know, the quality of the communities we live in, our schools, our infrastructure, and, and that money trickles down to small business and, and, and encourages more free spending. So really in terms of sourcing talent, it's most optimal for this area uh, based on what brings in dollars um, to, to try and sequester those into the manufacturing, finance, and insurance, and healthcare fields. I always tell people the easiest way to explain it is, right, manufacturing brings in the roast most revenue produces the most money, uh, obviously for our region, right? And a lot of the largest healthcare and insurance policies in, in business um, for healthcare and finance and insurance is done with manufacturers. And then they make a lot of products, right? So they gotta get things from A to B. Um, so that's where you see the transportation pick up there. So really a way to describe our uh, region's economy best is if manufacturing is good, that's usually a sign that everybody else is going strong and thriving as well. Whereas if manufacturing is slower or um, have, um, 
having some variant instability, then you might see our uh, regional economy dip a little bit in that space. Mitch did touch on construction statewide. Construction has been the only market that showed positive gain, you know, pre and post pandemic across the state. So that's been a real good buffer uh, in leading the charge and us being able to bounce back so quickly is that we had the, the income, the dollars coming in from a strong construction market uh, going forward. But really that's paramount in terms of, you know, where we're going to go. A good example of that is what happened in Wisconsin Rapids, unfortunately, during, um, you know, the COVID pandemic is the first example, right? So there's different things being reported on a week to week basis, whether they're being acquired or not. Uh, but just, you know, ballpark, let's say, you know, first of all, infinite and they're not going to be coming back and, and that you know company's going to close down for the rapids region what's that mean for the economy well that's roughly 900 lost jobs in that community um 15 million dollars in lost revenue and 130 million dollars in lost earnings for the people that work there so obviously that's less free spending uh, and, and money that you know trickles down to other markets and, and other um economic sectors so that reflects that's going to have a reflective negative effect on those other markets as well. So that's why uh, manufacturing is so important in these communities because it's such a large goods producing job where you, uh, people here can earn a lot of significant dollars higher than that $55,000 threshold uh, that benefits so many other uh, labor markets and our economy as well being so closely tied together. Um, our largest occupations in terms of just number of jobs, obviously Mitch talked about it here, but it's reflective in this slide as well. Um, this is re specific job occupation titles, though, not by sector. So obviously our, our most competitive would be office and administrative support, production, transportation, material moving, sales, and going down the line. Uh, the best way to interpret this slide, right, if I'm working in HR, working for a business and industry, knowing what I know on the previous slides about, you know, basically from the third graders in the K-12 system until the seniors graduating now, there's going to be a dip. Um, due to number of students coming out. A lot of those students were born either pre or, or during or post our last recession, right? When money was tight, we had less people. Um, encapsulate that with the baby boomers retiring and also factoring the loss of the, the, the family farms and things. Um, based on market share number of jobs open, these are gonna be your more competitive markets, the ones with the, the higher volume or higher population of the blue line. So those are the occupations that if you're looking at securing talent, you're going to have to get really creative going forward in terms of things you might offer people looking in those fields because those are going to be more competitive markets moving forward. Total growth occupations, so based on economic and labor market data in terms of where we see industries tracking, these are going to be your top growing occupations, uh, now factoring in retirements as well. So healthcare practitioners and technical healthcare support staff obviously are going to be paramount um, production as well based on the way the healthcare and manufacturing sector is, is tracking in terms of growth related occupations and then we talked about construction being strong as well in terms of your big three but in terms of not only growth occupations coupled with what i just said in the last slide uh, these type of support positions uh you know based on those markets that they're in the manufacturers the healthcare and the construction field might I have to get more competitive in terms of what they're offering for talent for the you know next five to eight years as well as we're going through this in demand so this is based on top posted occupations in quarter four of last year so this is new or unique monthly postings that are occurring highly competitive market in our region for healthcare occupations a lot of need more specifically for medical assistance and rn registered nurse support transportation and material moving um, in the auto diesel uh, collision uh, realm as well and also our material handlers um, and our CDL over the road drivers as well has been been a high market demand. Um, you see sales related occupations and our, our finance and insurance and manufacturing transportation and retail uh, sectors as well. A lot, a lot of sales jobs being opened. A lot of those sales jobs too that are being posted on the unique monthly postings um, like I talked about they're actually jobs that may require some knowledge, some engineering background or some, some uh, industry level expertise that might require higher than normal skill sets versus just entry level sales as well. Then you see uh, down the line. So these are gonna be your most, these are your, the two previous slides dictate where your most competitive um, occupations are gonna be trending forward than specific job titles. This is what's most in demand of the hot jobs 
uh, for our region right now. <clears throat> and then, uh, so a, a recent uh, job openings poll that uh, was done, done on December 9th um, showed that these are the openings that we have for North Central over a four week period. Um, so again, you'll see uh, production workers at the top of 2,196 jobs, followed by production workers, all others, 760 jobs, um, followed by registered nurses, heavy and tractor, trailer, truck drivers, nursing assistants. So you'll see that we have a big demand of these occupations, uh, you know, that really fall under the healthcare and manufacturing and trade transportation utilities industry. So we already have a big demand of filling these positions. Um, and again, that will that will become more of a difficulty uh, to fill as we move on with our aging labor force. Um, you know, so trying to get ahead of this uh, curve will be very important as we move forward. So looking at uh, labor force shares um, by age, and this is by done by quarterly workforce indicators uh, for 2020 quarter one. Uh, so the North Central region is in that dark green and on the right side of that graphic or of that graph, you'll see that our age group of 45 to 54, 55 to 64 and 65 to 99. We actually have higher proportions of those older age groups uh, than the state of Wisconsin as a whole. So again, this really just kind of highlights that uh, we're going to have more of a more of a struggle than um, what other areas around the state will have. Um, now, looking at labor force shares by education, and again, Derek touched on this earlier, um, but the the bar on the right side of the graph um, it shows that for our bachelor's degree educated labor force, uh, we have a little bit of a smaller proportion. Um, as compared to Wisconsin. But again, that's really just more so of a, due to the fact of the mix of jobs that we have here. It's not that we're not educated. It's just a reflection that we're high in manufacturing and those types of uh, positions and jobs. And then looking at labor force share by race, uh, you'll see that Wisconsin um, is already predominantly white at 87.8%. Um, in North Central's even less diverse than that at 93.2%. Uh, so our labor force is certainly not uh, racially diverse. Uh, and then this slide, it shows a really good, um, it really illustrates the, the problem that we're gonna have in manufacturing specifically. So that, that dark red line or maybe reddish brown line uh, that shows the 55 to 64 year age group and you know, since it's inclining, kind of like a flight of stairs, you see that we don't have as much um, of a youthful age group of workers to fill in those positions that are going to be left behind by that by that 55 to 64 year age group. So manufacturing is going to be struggling, uh, probably the most. Um, you know, bar what kind of uh, automation and um, that sort of thing kind of comes into the picture. But as is for right now, manufacturing is going to be struggling the most uh, compared to other industries. Um, and then the next industry is healthcare and social assistance that has the most um, workers in that 55 to 64 group. Uh, however, you can see that it's kind of the flip flop of what was going on with manufacturing. In the sense that you actually have a, a very youthful um, proportion of workers uh, in that industry to kind of fill in those positions that will be left behind. But Certainly manufacturing will, will definitely have some struggles up ahead. Uh, and now this is uh, from the National Household Survey, uh, Table A12 uh, from Bureau of Labor Statistics. But it shows uh, the duration of the unemployed that we had in 2020. Um, and if you look at the middle of the table, you can see the average mean duration in weeks of the unemployed. Um, and it went from 20.5 weeks in January 2020 up to 22.8 weeks in December 2020, and then up to 24.3 weeks in January 2021. Uh, so we've been seeing this trend of the long-term unemployed um, that's been growing. Uh, and what this means is that people are taking even longer now to find jobs, <clears throat> to find new jobs or to be called back to their old job, uh, of which many believe will not be coming back at all. Um, so this is really just a good way of highlighting uh, the issue that we've been seeing with the long-term unemployed kind of being on the rise for the most part, um, but it might start kind of plateauing out 
Uh, as you look at the very bottom of the table, you can see uh, percent distribution of those who have been unemployed 27 weeks um, or longer. And you'll see in January 2020 is at 18.7%, increased to 37.3%, and then increased to 37.5%. So you see that the, the long-term um, point of those being unemployed has been kind of growing, um, but I believe it might be kind of plateauing out as you look at the median duration um, of the unemployed weeks, and that's kind of dropped back down from 16.1 of December 2020 to 14.5 for January 2021. But certainly we still have this very long-term unemployed um, factor kind of going on. Um, and also here's some uh, national findings that um, you may have kind of frequently seen, um, but the COVID uh, employment effects vary by demographics, you know, such as age, gender, race, and ethnicity. Uh, one of the most notable is that the industries that have been most impacted by COVID is recreation and entertainment venues, uh, and those are predominantly staffed by women and minorities. So as a result, unemployment rates among women and people of color have increased more than the general population. Uh, and then also jobs likely to be automated are generally less likely to you know, allow remote work and, and are at higher risk of virus transmission, um, You know, more likely to have shutdowns, layoffs, quarantines, uh, and lastly, job losses and automatable occupations may become permanent. Um, and this is what was heavily seen during the Great Recession. Um, so that kind of leads us to believe that we may certainly see some um, level of job losses in this uh, pa pandemic as well. Oops, what, what do I do ahead here? Oh, sorry about that, Derek. That's all right, no problem. Yeah, so you, you can see obviously, right? We have a we have a people shortage problem here. Less people coming out of the K twelve system, less opportunity to recruit from other counties or surrounding areas. Being that the aging out factor, Mitch touched on greatly the um, loss of the baby boomers and what that's going to mean, and kind of forecasting the job share by by age uh, demographics showing less than normal. We also talked about you know the young kids, right, coming you know that are in high school. Less of them are going to the workforce. A lot of that has to do with what's coming for the future and also the fact that in order to be more higher skilled to get some of the new jobs that are coming to the future requires higher levels of education, um, which is why that you know number dips a little bit because it's more competitive, obviously, to uh, get into the institutions to acquire that education than ever before. So a lot more extracurricular activity involvement. But Mitch talked about automation in this last slide. That kind of goes in hand in hand with education. And I talked about at the beginning of the slide how uh, slide presentation, uh, I touched on that educational background. Well, what we're really facing is something uh, quite revolutionary. A lot of our economic uh, development partners on the phone might be able to test this well and kind of why broadband is going to be so important going forward, not only for our business and industry, but also in, in playing a role in recruiting new talent to the area and protecting our, our tax base from an infrastructure standpoint. But we are really at the forefront of um, the industry 4.0 wave to combat some of these shortages. Um, it's expected to be here and be prevalent um, in the United States economy in, in the next two to three years and last all the way up until 2060. Now, the tax ramifications uh, projected from this um, in terms of a, a positive net growth potential have labeled, some are labeling it now the fourth industrial revolution. And what it really is is tying a lot of your data integrated sourcing in your, your engineering principles, your, your data analytics and in your business analytics departments um, and kind of interweaving them across the landscape of the careers that exist now to create new jobs, more automated jobs that are going to require, like Mitch talked about, there's a stigma around automation that it replaces jobs, right? Or it gets rid of jobs or eliminates jobs. It actually, from my perspective, I think it creates new jobs that require higher levels of education um, to run and automate these machines. So that's really where we're tracking uh, as not only a, a global or national, but regional economy as well. And kind of the race to whoever can implement it first is where you're probably gonna see your best turn, your best growth, or, or more to your bottom line for a business and the community. And I talked about it's really developing extreme computing power, right? It's bringing the principles from the left side and the right side um, together to create um, you know, maximal output, maximal efficiency, um, less lost time, uh, more profitability for an organization and shape some new new career paths. Um, in terms of what skill sets are needed uh, for these new jobs, here are some of them in terms of what our young people 
uh, might want to be focused on as they're going through the, the K-12 system to be better employees for you as the future. Um, this is from the World Economic Conference last year. Automated Automation engineering, data analytics and visualization, data science, digital manufacturing, app development, computer science, artificial intelligence. It's really taking all those computer and IT uh, core principles and integrating them across you know, all platforms of, of business and industry. So you, you might see that all the way down from the, the entry level food service occupations all the way to lights out manufacturing, right? It's really gonna be a cross integrated approach. Um, broadband is gonna be intrinsically import, um, important for local communities to make sure that we can achieve that. Our businesses can grow and, and stay vibrant and we can put the talent in the right place to succeed. Uh, to combat this this people shortage. Um, just to, how it's going to change the job landscape. Um, top 10 emerging roles on the left in the blue, uh, replacing the top 10 declining roles and kind of reshaping what those are going to look like. Data entry clerks uh, might now become data scientists or data analytics uh, folks, big data specialists, um, digital transformation specialists, really re replacing some of these office and admin supports, which is worse. Um, support jobs, which you saw were in high demand and high need in, in previous slides. So really reshaping and re rethinking and retooling what each career is going to look like to be more optimal as a business and offset some of this people shortage, right? Because the easiest way to put it, if everybody in the, the greater Wassa area came out of the, the K-12 system and went just into manufacturing, being that that's where our largest GRP was, you know, we'd, we'd fill less than 8% of the market demand in terms of number of jobs based on Mitch's slide. So businesses as a whole need to figure out a way to be more optimal because it's not, it's just not smart business in the in the human capital game or from a critical mass standpoint. Um, you know, we can't get in the, into, you know, bidding awards and things that's going to drastically affect the sustainability and vitality of your organization and the industry going forward. So really retooling and thinking about the future going forward uh, is where we're at right now. Um, Automation exposure by region. Uh, Mitch, I, think, I believe this is yours if you want to take it. Yeah. <clears throat> so in uh, 2013, the University of uh, Oxford, uh, they had a study done by Osborne and Frey. Uh, so they looked at uh, all the occupations and industries with, or the occupations within those industries. Uh, and they determined kind of what was the percent of jobs that would be exposed to automation uh, at some point in the future. Uh, based off of what kind of skills does that job require. So if it's a job that requires a lot of repetitive tasks, that would be a job that would be able to be automated at some point in the future, as opposed to jobs that required, you know, high level um, critical thinking types of skills. Uh, so <clears throat> first off, you can see that Wisconsin has a higher automation exposure than the U.S. And then in the middle of the graphic, you'll see North Central. Um, and we're even higher than, uh, you know, the Wisconsin uh, exposure level. So our region is going to be more likely to be exposed to automation, but again, it's likely due to kind of the jobs and uh, occupations that we have here. So now looking at um, North Central's um, automation exposure by occupational group, uh, the occupation, the occupational groups that are at the top um, show on the left side really the percent automated. So what percent of those jobs will become automated at some point in the future. And then the right side of the graphic, those blue bars show what uh, percent of employment those occupational groups currently make up uh, for our region. So at the top you see food prep uh, and serving, sales, administra administrative support, production, transportation, and material moving. Uh, so those, those uh, occupational groups that are at the top, they make up a good portion of our uh, employment here. Um, and they're also uh, the most likely to be uh, automated at some point in the future. Um, the study didn't really mention as to when we would see that happen, but just that, just the fact that they can and will be automated at some point down the line, because those are gonna be the occupations that have repetitive tasks, as opposed to higher uh, critical thinking types of skills. And now looking at automation exposure by typical education requirements, you know, uh, Really, to no surprise, the the higher level degree of education that somebody obtains, the less likely that you know that said occupation would be exposed to automation because of that higher level uh, critical thinking skills that are involved with those occupations, as opposed to um, the jobs that don't require the higher level of education, because those can really be um, 
you know, kind of replaced by machinery and AI um, much more quicker and efficiently. Um, and then here's a slide uh, by the census, and this is 2018 um, ACS or five year ACS, and it shows the ability to telework. Uh, so this is looking at the population with a computer and what percent of that um, has an internet subscription. And so what we see statewide is that 85.1% of the population with a computer um, has internet subscription or has internet. Um, and for our region, we only have two counties that are actually above that statewide rate, which is Marathon County uh, and Portage, Portage being at 88.8%. Uh, so overall as a region, we have a lot of counties that um, are significantly lower than that statewide rate. So what that means is um, we're going to be a little bit less able to kind of do the, the jobs and occupations that are going to be providing telework or telework. Um, as opposed to other areas around the state. Uh, and this is, it's been an increasing trend, I think it's touched on later, um, but a lot of jobs are trying to offer people the ability to work from home. However, if you don't have good enough, you know, internet or Wi-Fi, that's gonna, that's really gonna hamper um, our labor force's ability to do so, especially as we move forward and, you know, all sorts of uh, different types of technologies come out into play. Uh, so what's to come? You know, there's a possibility that the employment landscape has been forever changed but by the pandemic. Uh, so, for example, remote work um, or telecommuting, as we just touch, touched on, uh, is it's been a rising trend um, even before COVID, um, and it's really become a necessity for those whose jobs can accommodate it. Um, and it's definitely been something that's been seen a lot, um, especially as of lately. Uh, and then also some businesses have already decided to treat office space as a benefit rather than requiring their employees to return on a regular basis. Um, and if more people choose to live in uh, rural areas, uh, infra infrastructure needs such as high speed Internet access, healthcare capacity and school capacity will need to be able to, to accommodate. This is just painting a picture. So you yeah. did a study. Um, during the pandemic where they basically uh, reported business and industries, you know, vitality or sustainability on self-reporting on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, so you can just see that um, for one or more months, uh, we had a significant number of, of companies taking advantage of, of payroll protection or other things or reporting some some difficulties. So greatly experienced by all the, you know, numbers of the uh, large numbers or large quantities of, of economic sectors in the region um, greatly affected by the pandemic to reinforce, but also large numbers of those reporting that obviously they're looking at things like Mitch talked about, uh, which is obviously automation and some different options in assessing some of that data. Uh, and here's some more information about, you know, what, what what's expected uh, to come. Um, you know, when the pandemic is, has subsided, uh, which will hopefully be in the near future, uh, you know, Wisconsin will still face the workforce conditions uh, caused by the retirement of the aging baby boomers that we talked a lot about on. Uh, and the primary long-term challenge facing Wisconsin's economic future remains workforce quantity. Uh, you know, the state must make all available workers tech savvy. Uh, and then last bullet point here, the pandemic has only accelerated automation trends uh, as businesses work to lower operating costs while also trying to avoid workplace COVID infections. Uh, and jobs replaced by robots during the pandemic uh, will not be coming back in the same capacity. Um, as we kind of certainly seen in um, earlier um, pandemics. This is just our, paints a picture of our critical mass. Right? We touched on it when we were talking about the automation statistics and, and, and the self-reporting, but we basically had six to eight years of K-12 uh, declining enrollments. A lot of that is due to, like we talked about, smaller family sizes, uh, people moving out of the area, um, things like that. Uh, we're at basically full employment now. So just, you know, summarizing everything we talked about today. We have impending 25% retirement. Mitch talked about, and we, we saw on some of the slides, the aging out of the workforce and the lack of young capital readily available um, in our supplementary counties and surrounding markets. And then uh, by 2030, another 25% of the workforce in a lot of these sectors, based on the demographic slides you saw, will be retiring. 
Um, and that's why the automation component becomes so important to make in prepping our people tech savvy. Simply put, we can do all the recruitment we want in the world. Uh, we can do uh, all the throw all the dollars at the people. We just don't have the bodies uh, to address the issue. Um, and this is really one of the only ways that we're going to solve a lot of the issues for uh, businesses going forward is the onset of the automated career path. And here is, uh, you know, the projected employment recovery time. This was done by uh, the Department of Revenue. Uh, so for the Wausau location, it's believed that we'll have uh, a full recovery uh, sometime in the year of 2022. Uh, and then Wisconsin as a whole, it's expected that we'll have our full employment recovery uh, sometime in 2023. So this is just kind of their um, expectations when we'll hit that full employment again. And that's just mission my it's, uh, contact information on the slide. I would say that any business or industry that is going into any talent discussions uh, moving forward that would like some guidance, uh, Mitch is here as a free resource to everybody um, that's not aware of him. So uh, please feel free to reach out to him. He can customize um, any data sets that you're looking for and give you some guidance in terms of defining those, what those mean. But Renee, we can open it up to the questions right now. Perfect. Yeah, thank you to you both, uh, Derek and Mitch. Based on the information that you shared, it certainly sounds like we'll have our work cut out for us in the years to come. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the Q&A session for um, today's event. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible with the time that we have allotted. Um, with that, I'd like to encourage our listeners to submit questions in the chat feature on the left side of the screen at this time. Um, as we have those questions rolling in, um, I'm wondering if we could start with what advice um, do you have or additional strategies that you can recommend for companies to implement as they're navigating through the talent shortage dilemma now and into the future? I think it's based on what we talked about, right? Um, in, integrating and looking at automated principles would, would certainly be paramount to making sure that you have the infrastructure to do so. But prior to the pandemic, um, when we were experiencing record low unemployment and a 17 year record low, I was advising businesses to look at the labor shed. So based on the maximal opportunity that was available at that time when the economy was strong, your labor shed was really about 60 miles. <clears throat> Coming out of the pandemic, uh, our businesses are, are still growing back to recovery, as Mitch illustrated, that number has kind of dwindled to 30 miles. So the, my best advice to businesses has always been, in terms of the jobs that you're having large turnover at, and obviously you want your turnover rate in order to uh, uh, show profitability in your bottom line to be as close to 10% as possible based on you know, you know, know attrition and retention. Um, one of the ways to get there is to start thinking about uh, your competitive markets a little differently. So I, I always tell them, draw a circle around your business 30 miles out, okay? And think about, don't think about, if I need a production, production associate, right? Don't think about what is every other manufacturing company paying for, you know, actual level production associates, if that's my number one issue. I need to look at what's everything else that that person can do within 30 miles that's available to them, right? Um, so, and what's that environment look like? What's that culture look like? A lot of people have the, a lot of companies have the stigma that, um, you know, if I pay more, I'll get the best people. Um, I think that that's falsified based on national Gallup data, pay is actually number four. So we have the millennial generation, which touched on the baby boomers uh, leaving the workforce. Different core principles, different needs, different workplace, work-life balance issues, right? So it's really cultural shifts to acquiesce or, or recruit that younger talent. We saw a few of the, the larger economic markets struggling with the younger talent in that workforce. Um, so it's really shifting. I think the days of the uh, seven-day shift work because we need to meet production have gone by the wayside. It's looking at more innovative options so people can spend time with their families. Uh, I know Mitch talked about um, you know, the telework aspect. I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic for businesses is maybe they realize they don't need as much infrastructure as before. Performance is still optimal. Maybe people can work from home. We do have rising daycare and healthcare costs. Um, it's projected that um, by 2030, someone's mortgage and healthcare costs will um, 
you know, require 88% of their gross wages. So, you know, lowering that and offering more comprehensive, flexible benefits options might be something as well. And then I always tell people to the, uh, the livable wage, because I see Ann's got a question here for how $15 an hour, uh, the minimum wage might affect long-term unemployment. Well, really, I don't think it's as bad as people are making it out to be. So the livable wage right now for Marathon County is 1301. And that's defined as what an individual needs to make, um, not factoring internet or cable or a car or a cell phone, just to be able to feed and house themselves with the climbing rent costs and cost of living, just to feed and house themselves and walk to work is 1301, right? So um, I don't think that a lot of these areas that are experiencing talent shortage gaps um, can afford to even be at that 13 to $15 an hour range. An easy example of this would be in 2014, when I first started, the number one in-demand high-skilled trade was machinists. And the going rate for that at the time was $14 an hour. And that's for an actual machinist. A machine operator is somebody completely different that more or less just pushes the button with preloaded engineering software already in the machine to make sure it doesn't crash, right? Well, you can't even get somebody to retain as a machine operator for 18 to 22, so what do you gotta pay a machinist now? I think the Based on the shortage, the market's kind of take care, taking care of itself. That $15 an hour range for that minimum wage occupation, I think that's where you're gonna see that job loss that Mitch talked about, where those jobs are gonna be replaced and increasingly more automated to circumvent that. And businesses will start allocating the, the higher paying salaries or wages towards those higher skill sets that are needed elsewhere. Um, so that kind of answers that question. But first of all, if you're not paying 1301, I definitely change that. Think about where you're sourcing your talent. So. 30 miles out, you know, can they make more money at a, at a gas station and what's that environment look like or, you know, compared to what, what's offered here and what's that look like? And also for a lot of young kids and people coming out looking to enter the workforce or, or people from other markets, creating um, high ceiling occupations versus low ceiling. So implementing um, in-house training programs to kind of move the ceiling. So. You know, based on what I put in, I have the opportunity for, for rapid advancement, especially with the anticipatory retirement, and I can kind of upskill myself. And I know tech colleges are, are great partners and providers to, to provide some of that skill. So more of those different programs and solutions of moving the ceiling and getting more flexible with your benefits can be ways that you can right off the bat probably recruit talent that you need for the right price points um, versus just paying somebody more money. But really think about it holistically of what's everything else that a young person can do. Understanding that they have workplace principles and competencies, the baby boomers, they're going to look at what the easiest option is. So really going forward, the nature of the work has to match the salary number one. And then what's everything else on top of it that can be more fruitful? Is it the ability to work from home so they don't have to pay child care costs and different things like that? It can be differentiators and, and, and acquiring talent in the short term. But long term, definitely looking at those automation opportunities. And just to echo what Derek was uh, talking about, um, I just wanted to highlight with uh, trying to be competitive in terms of wages. Um, I completely agree with Derek where, you know, you shouldn't just be worrying about, you know, what the person next to you is, uh, you know, kind of paying out, uh, especially with, you know, kind of a lot of jobs being able to be worked from home. I think there's going to be a lot more competition in terms of um, wage allocation in the future. Um, but also, I think we're starting to have a labor force that's a little bit more knowledgeable in terms of seeing what jobs are available for them to work in, you know, kind of a bigger area around themselves, um, as opposed to many, many years ago um, with different uh, different types of, you know, job sites and that sort of thing. So, you know, instead of just being competitive um, in terms of wages with the exact occupation of other employers, you should also be seeing um, you know, what other jobs could that job seeker, um, you know, be working and for what wage? I know this is sector specific too, but it's one small thing that often goes overlooked. Um, would I would encourage exit interviews, um, especially going forward now? I mean, I know WAS is trying to rebrand itself and doing a great job. Uh, you guys are in terms of your, your talent recruitment approach, but how great would it be if everybody just tried to be the best place to work at? One of the things in, in my day-to-day -day job in terms of uh, fixing this issue for business and industry that I saw pre-pandemic uh, when the economy was really strong is that almost nine out of 10 times when I went into companies that had large turnover on their front end, it was because it, you know due, due to the nature of the economy at the time, they were hiring underskilled people to fill positions that they 
ordinarily weren't qualified for and then reinvesting their, their own dollars to train those people up. Well, they were recruiting based on need um, those same people into supervisory or, or, or low-level management occupations without the leadership or management training needed to do an effective job. And that was causing a lot of the uh, attrition rates um, and, and the um, high marks there that were cost and effective for business and industry. So, you know, it might be something that you find out through exit interviews. It's just something as small as that fix, which isn't, you know, cost to turn in any way that can lead to a, a great culture shift in your business that isn't, isn't necessarily pay. So that's another just example. Great information, guys. Really appreciate all of your um, insights and perspectives. Um, just to be respectful of everyone's time, that is all the time that we will have available for questions. We received a lot of requests for um, copies of the PowerPoint, so we'll try to work with our presenters today to see if that's available um, to share with our attendees. The Again, um, the uh, program was recorded and will be available on our um, chamber YouTube and social media sites. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to thank our presenters again. Um, great job, great information, and also thank you to everyone who joined us today for today's live webcast. Um, I strongly encourage you to reach out to our presenters. As you can see, they're a wealth of information and can provide custom um, customizable services for our businesses and um, can be free of charge. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone. Have a great week and watch for upcoming um, programs and events on the Chamber's website. Thanks. Thank you, Renee. Stay warm. Yes, thank you.